All right, thanks so much. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Lisa Federer. I am the National Library of Medicine Data Science and Open Science Librarian, and I work quite a lot with the Office of Data Science Strategy on data-related activities. Um, so very happy to have you all here and uh, very happy to have three awesome presenters who are going to uh, hopefully introduce you to some new ways that you can take advantage of services at your institution um, by telling you a little bit about some of the services that they're offering through their libraries. So um, I do wanna sort of frame this session a little bit. Um, this session is not intended to provide policy guidance. Um, we are, are not telling you how to uh, comply with any policies, but hopefully uh, introducing you to some resources that you can take advantage of um, at your institution and encourage you to uh, learn a little bit more about what your library might offer. So we are going to start with Vicki Steves, who is the Librarian for Research Data Management and Reproducibility at NYU's Division of Libraries, who's going to talk a little bit about um, writing data management plans for grant applications. As I'm sure you all know, um, NIH did release its uh, new data management and sharing plan policy yesterday. So hopefully this will uh, get you inspired uh, to think about how you can uh, get some assistance on writing your new plans. So Vicki, take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Lisa. So hi, I'm Vicki Steves. Uh, I'm gonna drop the link to my slides in the chat and I'll go ahead and share that screen. So you all should see my slides now. Um, I'm gonna be talking today about collaborating on data management plans and on data management planning with uh, folks at your local institution. Uh, feel free to tweet any part of this talk that you want. My Twitter handle is there. Um, and yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. So before I dive into sort of the what data management plans are, how you can structure them and write them and the tools and uh, that can help you with that, I'll just define our terms. So because uh, these vary across disciplines, as I'm sure everyone here is aware. Uh, we're going to refer to the Federal Office of Management and Budget Circular, which a lot of uh, data management plan guidance has been based on. And the definition says uh, data is the recorded factual material commonly accepted in the scientific community as necessary to validate research findings. And this is a uh, holistic. It's meant to provide a wider view of data than simply like a spreadsheet or some statistics. Uh, it is also referring to like contextual information around how that uh, work was generated, tools, um, software, things like that. So we're taking a very holistic view of data. And uh, on the right, I have the dreaded research life cycle. Um, I joke that like at each one of these circles, I'd like the create data, process data, analyze data. Each of these is a life cycle in and of itself as well. So take this diagram with a grain of salt. But uh, I think it does a good job of illustrating the goals of data management, which is basically managing the way that data is uh, moved, analyzed, processed through this life cycle with the goal of sustainability and of greater reuse by your community, but also you yourself. You wanna make sure that a few years down the line, you can still open and understand your, uh, your research materials. So that's sort of the goal. And data management is important and has real world consequences. So it's, I don't want to frame data management like uh, taking your medicine. It's actually really important for practice, the practice of research and how research can be communicated and validated. So there's a great article I would point you to that came out in Current Biology around five-ish years ago that showed basically the odds of a data set where it's referenced in an article where someone might say something like, email me for it, or it's on my department server or something like that, the odds of the data being there actually fell by about 17% per year. So you feel like five, five to six years, um, there's a very low chance of the data being there. So these are, uh, you know, data underlying papers that we're all citing or that some of that, you know, we're citing. This is about the scholarly record. And so this is a very real consequence of uh, a lack of data management planning at the onset of a project. Um, so I would highly encourage folks to read this paper. I provided the link there. There's also, where'd my full screen go? 
this is another sort of data horror story, I guess, for your pre-Halloween data management seminar. So um, this is a famous case of uh, stem cell research where the original researcher uh, did not engage in any sort of uh, structured data management. And in fact, in some cases for their published research, there was actually no original data at all to back up figures and images that were included in papers. Sometimes no documentation of experiments at all. And, you know, obviously this comes with retractions and uh, other sort of real world ripples um, that we would then have to deal with. So just a few uh, pre-Halloween data horror stories to underscore how important the work is, um, even though certainly it sometimes can be regarded as not as fun as your analysis, but it really is uh, critically important to the sustainability in, of your work. So we want to limit this risk, and one way that we can do that is with some data management planning, and one way that we can do that is with data management plans, of course. So data management plans are a two-page long document that you would include with your grant application across a number of different funding agencies, including the NIH, uh, as Lisa mentioned, um, NSF, NEH. A lot of private funders as well are adopting the use of data management plans. It basically asks you to do a little um, front-loaded work on thinking through uh, how you will manage your research materials throughout the course of a project. So it's things like how will you collect the data and then organize it and describe it? Um, how will you store the data and any security concerns? Um, and ultimately, how will you share this data out right, with the rest of your community? So this two-page document is meant to provide an overview of those activities um, and an overview of also things like roles, responsibilities, and uh, budget concerns too can be folded in. So the data management plans have been around for almost a decade now, which is really exciting. So NSF, NOAA, and NEH required them in the beginning in 2011. NIH followed very shortly after. Um, we saw a big increase in data librarian jobs, which is really good for this talk because I'm going to be pointing you to how you can find data librarians and uh, library workers at your local institution to help you with these data management plans because we're there and we're eager to help. Uh, so we kept going and going and of course, as Lisa mentioned, NIH drops new guidelines just in time for this talk. So um, we have some new uh, guidelines around sharing that's that's been evolving over time. And this is a really positive indicator to that we see more agencies and more evolution of these uh, requirements over time too. So in terms of a data management plan, there are some like high level headings that you might hit, like you would cover, you would try to cover things like data formats, those related tools and uh, materials you would need to make the data useful later on, what standards they're using, if there are any like community centered work uh, around data formats or metadata and documentation that you'd want to be leveraging, you want to you'd want to note that. Um, some other headings that you would just try and hit in your data management plan are things like access and preservation, like which repository would you be reposit uh, depositing the data into, things like that. Policies for access and distribution, and then of course those roles and responsibilities, because ultimately. Data management will be a distributed activity, but there should be some, some levels of responsibility, right? So these are sort of the high level headings that are included in that two page document. Um, I often hear from folks at my own institution who are a little bit um, confused where to start. And I'm really happy that through lots of different channels, they find their way to me because I am the local support for data management plans. This uh, GIF on the right hand side I literally just searched in DuckDuckGo Research Data Services Library, and you can see there are so many, including NIH. There you go. Shout out NIH. So there is a very good chance that at your institution, there is somebody in your library who is either dedicated in the Research Data Services unit, like these many scrolling on the right, or um, there are either, either there's this um, department or there's typically ad hoc support for data management plannings data management plans. So definitely there is local support that you can leverage and I'll show you some different ways you can do that. If your institution doesn't have a library, there are chances that there are data managers or IT colleagues that you could also ask for help. And honestly, I'll just make this pitch. If none of those are options for you, you can always throw up the bat signal with the hashtag data lives and probably one of us will do our best. Um, 
but I will just say this, that there are people at your institution who are waiting and eager to help you sort of manage the process of writing your data management plan and getting providing you feedback on it. So you don't have to stare at a blank page with those giant headings. You can solicit some help. So this is the basic DMP workflow that you would write a DMP, your data management plan, using a templating tool. So you can use something like DMP tool, which I'll show you in this talk, or sometimes funders provide like Word document type templates that you can use, particularly if you're applying to specific institutes, centers, directorates, offices, whatever. Um, as you're writing your data management plan, I would also encourage you to think about adding data management elements into your budgets. The NIH has some supplementary guidelines about that that I've linked in this uh, slideshow. But uh, if you need things like storage, if you need help with things like um, transforming or adding metadata, like these are outlined as some allowable costs and I would encourage people to think through elements in their data management plan and how you could uh, structure your project budget to include those activities and to support those activities too. Because again, these tend to be distributed efforts. There are, there are PIs with, with students, with postdocs, with fellows um, who will often all be contributing to data management in some way. And if you can scaffold that with some resourcing, it's always very helpful, um, especially, yeah, can always be very helpful. So after you write your DMP, you feel like it's in good shape, you can send it off to your local library worker for a review. So again, I looked up research data services. You can look up just data services too. If you don't have a department like that in the library your institution, you should ask your subject specialist librarian, which definitely will uh, exist for you. So in, when in doubt, always go to your subject specialist and they can, they can do a handoff for you in their local library. What's nice about DMP tool too, if you choose to use it, and I'll go over what that is in just a second, um, it has a review feature built in, so there's also some uh, seamless access to reviews that can happen too. Then the last step is just to maintain your plan. You follow your DMP once it starts. However, it's a living document. As you're in your project, you might find that some things are changing. And if that's the case, just update your DMP and follow that new version. You don't have to be fully locked into a workflow that doesn't work for you. Um, make those changes, document those changes and follow them and make sure yeah, your collaborators are all on the same page with that as well. It's a big part of that roles and responsibilities piece. So I wanted to talk about DMP tool as a nice way to create DMPs. Uh, it's an open source tool maintained by the California Digital Library. Um, it's meant to provide templates uh, for writing data management plans according to the funder. Um, they have like a generic one as well, but if you would search for a particular agency or funding body, um, they have quite a few, so uh, likely you'll have some specialized guidance and specialized templating. You can collaborate, you can add people to your data management plans and have assigned sections and write comments to each other and all sorts of nice feedback mechanisms. They also maintain a list of public facing data management plans, which can be some good inspiration. I'll say that with the caveat that we don't actually know if they were all funded or not. So take it with a grain of salt, it's just public on the, on the internet, but um, it is nice to sort of see what, what other people are doing by the same token. So I like to look through the public plans for, for my own edification. Also, I love on their homepage, it says the NIH General is one of the most used templates of the DMP tool. So I think that's a pretty nice indicator and shows that there's a strong NIH presence there, which is great. So of course, my screenshot, oh, it doesn't, great. So in your in DMP tool, this is what it looks like. If I was to open it in a new browser or a new tab, you would see I'm not logged in. So this is the home page. You can see they have quite a lot of users and participating institutions. There are lots of ways you can sign in, like you can check if your institution is affiliated. There are quite a lot of affiliated institutions, so I would check there first if I were you. If not, you can always create a free, a free account and uh, log in with that. Once you log in, you are on this dashboard. I'm not going to my dashboard because I have some of my patrons' data management plans visible in my dashboard. I, I don't think they would appreciate me putting that up on a recorded webinar. So all I did was create, click a, uh, create a plan. And from here, it's really nice because you can do things like search NIH and it pops right up. I can uh, pick a 
specific sub-template, like a generic NIH or the genomic data sharing one. I can give it a test. I'm going to check off that this is my mock test. So I'll just say something like interesting grant. And when I create it, I'm brought to this uh, nice overview so I can add some metadata about my project. I can look at the different registries. If my grant already has a number, I can provide it there. Um, I can get guidance from lots of different people, add contributors, like I said, um, whoever is there. I can get some nice uh, overviews. And then, of course, the, the meat and potatoes of DMP tool is this uh, templating right here. So you can see on this side, they have some guidance, which will no doubt be updated today because of the new drop of the new NIH guidelines. So I expect this text will be changing soon. But you can see uh, they, add, they guide you through some of the questions you should maybe be asking yourself as you are writing your data management plans. What's nice too is since NYU is an institutional member, I can link out to like my own guides and add my own documentation here. And again, you can provide comments to add with contributors. So if uh, I want to provide some direct review on this data management plan within my group, I can do that with this comment feature here. So I like that with DMP tool, it makes it pretty uh, seamless to just get up and going with the data management plan with some nice guidance and uh, collaborative features built in. So, oops, here we go. This is the other thing I really like about the DM, DMP tool. So let's say you've written your data management plan and it's beautiful, it's ready to go, and you just want a last pair of eyes on it before you submit. Um, if you are an institutional member, there is a chance you might have this request feedback button. And this is one way that just directly sends your data management plan to, for instance, like the librarians running the service. So in this case, it's me. So I'd be sending myself this data management plan. But um, my patrons, so faculty and, and students who I help at NYU, also use this button to directly send me their data management plans for me to sort of walk through and keep an eye out on some of the best practices I have in the, in the back of my mind, make sure that they're hitting all of those, and I can send it right back to them pretty seamlessly from within a DMP tool. So you notice you can continue to like edit the plan in the meantime. Um, people can customize this message. So this is one, one way to get feedback on your data management plans just from an in, with an institutional support right in the plan. You can also just share it. So uh, if you want to invite someone specific as like an editor um, who can edit it, if you have uh, your local support email right on hand, you can feel free to just add their email in here and click submit and your data management plan will be sent to them for review. Then of course you can always like download it and email it to whoever you want as well. You're not really locked into any particular way of receiving feedback, which is really great because there are so many different ways that you could get feedback on this data management plan. You can download it in lots of different ways. Like in, if you wanted a CSV of your data management plan, you could get it um, or as plain text or docx. So you can continue editing like the look and feel of it or if you needed to cut in paste into a particular um, like grant edit submission system. There are lots of different ways that you can you can do that here and add in your own, you know, nice uh, formatting. So the DMP tool is a nice way to get that sort of templating and help walking through the different requirements of a data management plan while also being able to do things like request feedback, share your data management plan, and uh, solicit those reviews from your local librarians again who are very eager to help you. So, whoop. this is what I want to end with. If you take anything away from this talk, I would like it to be, oops, that you likely very have local support for data management plans and for data management activities in general. The folks in your library are extremely eager to collaborate with you. Um, reviewing DMPs is one of my favorite things to do in my own practice because I get to see a lot of the different types of research happening at the university. And it's a two page document. So it's honestly not a big lift. Like it's not a big ask. It's uh, 
sometimes a lot easier than those big uh, infrastructure projects I get called in on, you know, as a part of my job. So it's definitely something I enjoy doing. And uh, even beyond just reviewing those data management plans, there are likely folks at your institution uh, who can help you with those data related requests. So for instance, if they review your data management plan, they could possibly have suggestions for local resources or local uh, experts who could also help you on different parts of the process. So getting a DMP, writing a DMP and getting review for one is really easy using the DMP tool. It's a really nice facilitator for that templating and for that feedback loop. So yeah, I would just give a plus one to uh, all the librarians here. I think they're showing out sort of proves that this support exists and that they're very eager to be here and support you. So thanks to all the, uh, to, thanks to everyone for your kind time and attention. I look forward to answering your questions on Slack. My slides are there. That's my email address and uh, Twitter handle. And again, if you have questions for data librarians in general, if you attach the hashtag data libs to your question on Twitter, there's a very good chance that one of us will answer it. Um, we're very active on that platform. So I would also encourage folks to do that if you have other questions too. Um, Although you're obviously the, the folks at your local institution are a great, uh, are the best place to go first. So that's what I have for you. I have about 30 seconds left, but we're doing all the questions in Slack, right? Yeah, um, if we have time at the end, um, we can take questions here, but uh, just to make sure that we get through everybody's presentations, we'll, we'll hold off on the questions for now, though feel free to um, type any in the chat if you have any. And also, um, as Vicky said, there is a Slack channel, which I believe that Aaron put a link to in the chat. Um, so you can head over there. Thank you, Vicky. That was excellent. Um, and now we will go to Michael Witt, who is the Interim Associate Dean for Research, Research Data Administration, Libraries, and School of Information Studies at Purdue University. He's going to talk about institutional repositories and how they fit in the research data landscape. Um, some of you may have been on uh, Jenny Larkin's talk uh, just a little bit earlier today. She was talking about the sort of broader um, research data repository landscape. Um, so great to have Michael here to talk a little bit more about the institutional repository piece of that. Michael. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon with you. Uh, so the title of my talk is How Do Institutional Repositories Fit Into the Research Data Landscape? Uh, and so for those of you that were in the Data Repositories 101 uh, section, you, you heard Dr. Larkin uh, talk about uh, specialist repositories and domain repositories, which serve a particular uh, discipline, or maybe they contain data of a particular format or produced by a specific instrument. Um, I've kind of lumped these all into the, the, the umbrella term domain repository. Uh, there are also generalist repositories, which are things like Dryad and Figshare and the Open Science Framework, um, which are open to anyone, any discipline, have general metadata and, and kind of take all comers. And then the third kind are institutional repositories. Uh, so what I'd like to do in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, two things. I'd like to uh, talk through an example of an institutional repository. Uh, I'm going to speak to our repository at Purdue, which is called PER, the Purdue University Research Repository, because you know, obviously it's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, and then I'd like to share some thoughts with you about how I think institutional repositories can complement the, these other types of repositories, generalist repositories, and uh, specifically domain repositories, and kind of the, the fit into the, the research data ecosystem uh, that NIH is, is, is trying to advance through uh, its new policy. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about PER. Um, we try to simplify uh, how we describe the PER service to our researchers on our campus. So my institution is a research university, so if I slip into talking about campus, uh, I mean, you know, our institutional setting. Uh, my background's also in libraries, so uh, if I slip into library lingo too, I apologize in advance. Um, so we say that uh, PER will do uh, five things for you as a researcher. Uh, the first thing that it will help you do is it will help you uh, write and implement an effective data management plan. Uh, number two, uh, it'll provide you with uh, a space to collaborate with your researchers, your, your, your other researchers or your students uh, who are part of your project, whether they're you know, at, at our institution or, or they're elsewhere, uh, with uh, shareable uh, storage and some collaboration uh, project management types of features. 
Uh, number three, PER will let you publish your data in a scholarly context with descriptive metadata, uh, adhering to uh, a variety of standards, and with a digital object identifier or a DOI. Uh, in addition to publishing data, uh, we're getting ready to, to launch a new functionality of registering data where you, as a researcher, submit uh, a metadata record describing your data set along with the location of the data outside of the repository and a data access statement with instructions to the users on how to access the data. Uh, we have a number of scenarios with people um, they have data, they want to make it available, but they don't want to deposit it in any repository. They need to hang on to it for one reason or another, or it's a legacy data collection, or it's physical data, it's not digital data. So uh, that's a, another feature that we offer. Uh, the fourth thing is that we provide the capability for long-term data archiving and digital preservation, again, adhering to, to best practices and standards. And then uh, number five, uh, PER will help a researcher measure the impact of their shared data. And I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through each of these uh, for just a minute or two, uh, each of these five to, to give you a screenshot and show you kind of what this looks like in the, in the system. So number one, data management planning. Uh, this is really building off of what Vicki was talking about with the DMP tool. Um, we use the DMP tool, for example, we're one of the affiliated institutions. We love DMP tool. Uh, so we link to that off our off, off the PER webpage for sure. Um, we also maintain a list of the current funder requirements. Uh, so I just sent an email to update the NIH requirement uh, this morning. Um, we provide boiler boilerplate text that researchers can copy and paste into their grant proposals and then edit to suit their purposes to say um, how they're using our repository and to, to demonstrate to funders that they have institutional support for their, uh, for their data management. Um, and then we have uh, certainly consultation services. So uh, just like Vicki was talking about, uh, you know, whether it's email, whether it's uh, via telephone, or whether you just walk into our office, um, we'll help you uh, understand the requirements of your funder and to actually help you draft your data management plan, uh, review your data management plan with you, uh, et cetera. Um, we also do um, uh, uh, outreach to faculty and also other units within the university, within the institution. Uh, so periodically we'll work with our sponsored programs office and uh, work with the pre-awards, uh, the folks who help our researchers prepare grants to help them understand the requirements, uh, in particular around data management plans. Um, and then our workflow in our repository system actually supports this, uh, where we have integration between sponsored programs and in the libraries in our institu institutional data repository. So when a researcher goes to submit a proposal, um, most institutions have some kind of cover sheet or some kind of questionnaire that asks questions about, you know, are you working with nuclear materials? You know, uh, are you, you know, doing research involving human subjects? Well, one of those questions is, does your funder uh, require data management plan and sharing? And if they answer yes, the next question is, uh, will you be using, you know, what resources will you be using? Will you be using a domain repository? Will you be using PER? And if they indicate that they're using our repository, uh, once a month we get a report, uh, the repository staff gets a report that tells us which proposals were submitted that have data management plans that uh, where the researchers are proposing to use uh, the, the repository. And so we can, we can get ready for them. The other thing that happens is when the grants are awarded, we also get notified and we get sent the two-page data management plans. And so uh, in our context in a university, in a university library, we have uh, subject specialist librarians. So we have a chemistry library librarian, for example, who works in the chemistry library, who uh, is the liaison to the chemistry department, the faculty and students. And they understand the culture of research in chemistry and how research is funded and what those requirements are. And so what we do is we provide that subject specialist with the data management plan and the contact information for the PI and encourage them to contact them, uh, make sure they understand how to use the system, and to, to be able to facilitate them in managing their data. Now, we're not the data police. We're not, we're not enforcing or, 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 or um, doing compliance. It's really more, more about um, reminding our, re our researchers that they said they were going to do this and to assist them in, in using the service. Uh, so we've got that, that workflow piece that supports the, the DMPs uh, on our campus with our sponsored programs office. So that's DMPs. Uh, number two, the second thing, uh, relates to collaboration. And so when you create an account in PER, 
uh, and you can create a new project space. And the project space is basically like a kind of like Dropbox. It has some other features that are for project management, but uh, essentially you can invite your collaborators via their email addresses. Uh, it'll, send, uh, it'll send them an email with a link and they click on it. Uh, they can join the project. It looks similar to like a Git repository you can see on the screen. Uh, and what you can do is you can share and version and annotate uh, files in this space while you're doing your research. So this is before you would share your data. This is during the active part of the research. And what we do is uh, any, any, any Purdue affiliated person can create uh, a project. Actually, they can create as many projects as they want. Uh, and by default, they get 200, uh, I'm sorry, 100 gigabytes for their project uh, at no cost to them. Um, if they have a, a grant award that they've associated with the project, uh, they get a terabyte uh, of data. Um, this is just to encourage sponsored research, but not exclude research that is not funded because there's a, a tremendous amount of research and valuable research uh, that is uh, not tied to a, a sponsor or to funding. And so kind of the library ethos where the, the doors are open to everyone, we provide services to the community. Uh, we're doing the same thing on our, on our campuses and, and making the service available to all of our research community. And so uh, you create your project, you invite your collaborators, you share your files. Um, we have some protections here for restricted or sensitive data and some limitations. Um, we prompt the, research, the, the researchers with questions uh, like, are you working with government controlled or export controlled data? And if they answer yes, then it stops. It won't let them use PER because we're not, uh, we're not uh, allowed to do that per regulations. Uh, we also don't uh, support, we're not a HIPAA aligned system. So we don't work with protected health information. So if someone says they're, they're doing PHI, uh, we also stop them. Purdue doesn't have a college of medicine, so this isn't as big an issue for us. Uh, we also prompt to ask if the researcher has an IRB uh, protocol that's been approved. Uh, and if they say yes, then it just flags the project and lets them continue. But it makes our, our, our research staff, our, our repository staff aware that they're um, working with uh, data related human subjects. And then also if they're uh, working with students as a part of research uh, and come under FERPA guidelines, then uh, we prompt them for that. And uh, the project needs to be approved by our local FERPA compliance officer. So we have some, some protections in place there. Um, the, the, the way of getting data into and out of the system, uh, you can use the, the web-based interface of PER to do this. Uh, you can also use SFTP or you can connect to uh, Google Drive are the three main ways of getting data into and out of your project space in PER. And for some of our researchers, this is, this is what they use. They don't actually go on to publish their data. They just use this space to collaborate sometimes with their students, with classes, uh, if they need space to be able to work with uh, researchers at other institutions. But of course, we want to encourage them to do the research and, and publish their, their, their outcomes. And so the third step or the third feature is to publish or register data in a scholarly context. And so, you know, here, you know, uh, you would uh, go through a process of submitting your data, selecting your files, uh, ascribing metadata to the files, your authors, and ordering the list of authors, choosing what license you want to release your data under. Uh, we use Creative Commons Zero as the default protocol. Uh, if people uh, want a different license that isn't on the list, we have a capability for them to suggest a different license, uh, which we'll review and, and add if it's appropriate. Uh, we, we, only are implementing uh, open uh, licenses though, open access licenses. And so what happens is the researcher submits the, 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 the data files with their metadata and it sits in a queue uh, for up to two business days. And during those two business days, uh, there's a, a lightweight uh, curation process that happens. We have a full-time dedicated data curator who reviews the metadata and the data and we also have uh, subject specialist librarians that I mentioned before. Uh, we have you know, 34 of them, uh, each you know, with a uh, background in library science and then also in a particular discipline uh, who can um, uh, advise changes to the data, uh, provide some additional uh, assurance to the data, um, et cetera. And then uh, once the data set is approved, it becomes uh, publicly available uh, with a digital object identifier and uh, harvested metadata, uh, et cetera. Um, for the registration of data, uh, it's basically the same process, except uh, instead of a license, there is the data access statement. And then uh, instead of the actual data, 
um, there's the location and the process for how you would request the data. So number four, long-term uh, data archiving. Um, so uh, what we do is we make a commitment, an institutional commitment uh, upfront uh, that's, that's backed by an operation, operational budget to archive data for a minimum of 10 years. And this is stated in our preservation policy. And then what happens at the end of 10 years is the data are remanded back to the library to be managed as part of the library's collections. And, and we're, you know, um, we're, not, we're not in the business of, of throwing things away in the library, uh, things that are unique and are only uh, available through our institution. Um, when uh, the, uh, the data are archived, um, we have a, a process of creating archival information packages or AIP. Uh, we run a tool called Droid, which does file format identification and associates that with a pronom uh, registry entry so that we are aware of what formats of files we have and we monitor the obsolescence of those files and the software that are used to open those kinds of files. Uh, of course, we establish fixity, we gather premise uh, preservation metadata, and then what we do is we uh, preserve the data on uh, a platform called Locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. So we keep seven geographically distributed uh, copies, uh, uh, one of them being off the continent. Uh, and we belong to a group called the Meta Archive Cooperative, which provides governance uh, and institutional assurance, cross-institutional insurance assurance, such that if, if one institution fails to uh, be able to support the data, the other members of the cooperative will, will support it. And these are uh, primarily uh, libraries at research universities. So number five, measuring the impact of data. Um, you know, we provide to our researchers and also to, to, to users uh, the number of views and downloads of the data set, which is fairly standard. Uh, the other thing that we do is we track citations to the data uh, via the DOI. Uh, so you can see on the screen here, this particular data set has been uh, cited 101 times. We differentiate between affiliated and not affiliated citations. So we encourage researchers to cite their own data in their articles so that there's a linkage between the article and the data set. Uh, they already know about those. But what they're really interested in knowing is who else is using and citing their data. And so uh, that's a information and a feature that is, is fairly, fairly popular. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit in the time I have left about um, some features that I think are unique to institutional repositories or, or mostly um, unique to institutional repositories. Um, the first being, you know, just proximity, you know, the local consultation and curation uh, that we can do. Um, the background here is actually the front door to our office, uh, which is a, a public service point. So people can just basically walk in the door and ask for help with the data management plan or can sit down and, and talk about uh, what file formats might be good to use, um, what kinds of protections they need for their data, um, talk about things like persistent identifiers, or considerations for the FAIR principles or other best practices. Um, we will work with them to help them understand their funder requirements and draft their data management plans. Um, we'll also um, involve our subject specialists to help them determine where the best place is for your data, because the best place for your data may not be in PER, may not be in our institutional repository. Uh, it may be in a domain repository if there's one that's appropriate or some other specialized repository. Um, indeed, we'll help them uh, stage their data. Um, we'll meet with, the, we'll meet with the, the faculty, we'll meet with their graduate students, we'll meet with centers, with labs, et cetera, uh, and do training and do uh, in-person consultations. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the uh, network that we have to draw upon of the, the subject specialists um, allows us to bring in some domain expertise, um, but certainly not a capability that matches what uh, most of the domain repositories can offer. But it's a local service, um, and so people can, can walk up to walk in the door or they can call us. Uh, we're part of the institution and we can help them. Uh, the second thing is institutional assurance and, and integration. Um, so we offer our, our data repository service uh, at, at uh, no cost to our researchers uh, at, at a certain level. Uh, so if you've got your you know, 100 gigabytes, or your one gigabyte of publication, you get at no cost. Um, it's, we support all research at the university. Um, we have relationships uh, and trust built with our, with our researchers. Uh, in, in many cases, um, 
they're, um, they're new to data management plans or they're, or they're new to the idea of sharing data. And so we're able to, to, to do that kind of engagement and kind of the connect to the last mile, I guess, if you will, between the researcher and getting the proposal uh, understood and submitted. Um, you know, like I say, we, we integrate into other uh, local uh, workflows and systems and, and staff. So I mentioned uh, sponsored program services and the integration we have through our research office. Um, but also, uh, you can go to our library catalog, for example, and look up data sets from, from Purdue. Uh, we, you can integrate with researcher profile systems, things like current research information systems, uh, as well as other resources on campus. So um, it's, uh, you know, data management doesn't happen in a vacuum. Oftentimes, if it's computational research, they're working with uh, research computing and dealing with um, other, other infrastructure. Uh, HPC high performance computing and what have you. And we're in good, good communication with each other. And in many cases, we can pick up the phone and have a meeting, you know, with, with three of us together um, to, help, uh, to help the researcher. From the uh, institution standpoint, um, having, you know, Purdue researchers publish their data through PER um, helps the institution know where its assets are. Um, Knowing, you know, the data are scattered around, but, um, you know, you can, you can, if something is deposited in the local institutional repository, uh, we, we at least have that view of what data are being produced by uh, our researchers. And it helps to facilitate compliance. Uh, so what I was talking about before about following up on data management plans, and also our institutional repository went through a research quality assurance audit that was done by our research office. Uh, so, um, you know, there's that kind of, um, I guess, reputation or in assurance or trust of the institution. And also we have some researchers who want to have all of their research data in one place. Uh, in, in, with many institutional repositories, they also have publications. And so the publications can be in the same repository uh, as the data sets. Um, and um, they have the institutional affiliation or, or branding. And then the last thing is um, a home for long tail or interdisciplinary data, or really just providing a home for all data. Um, so, you know, there are data that just don't fit into specialized repositories. Um, and there's this idea of kind of a, a long tail of um, you know, interdiscipl interdisciplinary data or data that are just, um, you know, very, very specialized to beyond the point of the specialized repository or are not following some kind of uh, format or standard. Um, Michael, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're running a little bit over. So if you could just wrap up so we have time for us to give her talk. Sure, sure. So uh, just, just kind of in, in conclusion here, um, listening to Dr. Larkin's uh, talk, uh, she coined the phrase uh, uh, coopetition, which is kind of like these uh, uh, kind of, I think, really a, a a perception that domain repositories are competing with institutional repositories or vice versa. But I hope that's not the case. I hope that um, we're able to, as part of this research data ecosystem, uh, complement each other through our services. Um, so at least at our institution, we're really clear to say that, you know, if your publisher or your funder requires you to deposit data someplace, then you should use that place. You should use that repository. Uh, and then if you, if that's not the case, and there's a domain repository or a specialized repository, you should use that repository. And then otherwise, if you don't, then to use an institutional repository, we're, we're here for you. And a couple of resources um, were shared before, the DKNet and fairsharing.org. I wanted to share another resource, which is a RE3 data. Uh, in particular, once you step um, outside of the United States, and if you're looking internationally, this is a another uh, registry of research data repositories that is uh, global and multidisciplinary uh, and inclusive of all kinds of different repositories, including institutional repositories. And just, just to wrap up, um, I'll, I'll say the same thing that Vicki said. Um, you have uh, other resources besides just your repository, your institution, uh, in a lot of cases uh, in, your, in your library where you can ask for, for help in uh, planning and managing and sharing your research data. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So our final talk of this session is going to be from Peace 
Awesome Williamson, who is the Director for Research Data Services at the University of Texas Arlington Libraries. And she's going to talk about open science, which is a, a super important piece of all of this. So Peace, go ahead. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Peace Awesome Williamson. I'm the Director of Research Data Services at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, I'm going to be presenting today on collaborating with a library on data. I love that Vicki's presentation was also about collaborating and both Vicki and Mike Michael have made it clear that uh, we love to work with you. And so I think that that theme has carried through all the way to the end. Um, I put the link to my slides in the chat and you can also see it here on the screen. Uh, and I appreciate everybody who's made it to this session. So I'm going to be talking more about open science. I'll be talking generally about uh, the library's contribution, the library kind of as an industry as a whole. Obviously, every library is different and what they offer are different. Um, however, I'm going to be speaking generically with some examples of what we're doing at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, so the effort toward open science is really about transparency and accessibility. So research aims, me methods, materials, and processes should be made openly and um, as available as possible, which also includes open licensing. And when I use the term open, I'm using it as defined by open knowledge in 2005, which involves a standard which allows for reuse and remixing. However, in order for open science to occur, it involves a combination of infrastructure, policies and guidelines, incentives, and tools in addition to resources, skills, and quite a lot of effort. So it is not uh, just something that happens automatically. Um, therefore, librarians are natural partners in this endeavor. So as librarians are leading the open movement alongside many other scholars and activists, the open movement seeks to work towards solutions of open in uh, basically the spirit of transparency, collaboration, reuse, and free access. And that encompasses open science, open government, open pedagogy, and so much more. So participatory processes, sharing of knowledge and outputs, and open source software are among its key tools. And the specific definition of open as applied to data, uh, knowledge and content is also along with that same open definition. So with these aims, many libraries are actively transforming by increasing their capacity for supporting the open movement. You may see this at your institution. It may have already happened or it may be in progress. And I think that progress uh, just continues. So at the University of Texas at Arlington or UTA, um, this is a great example. So UTA has a unique role in contributing research as one of the few institutions in the US that is both an R1 doctoral university and a Hispanic serving institution. Um, we are ranked one of the top uh, most diverse universities in the country. Um, and we also have a large amount of research output. Likewise, over the last five years, the university has seen a 52% uh, growth in research expenditures, setting records annually. And so you can see the shift toward research that is occurring at our, at our campus. Um, the libraries have played a strong role in this by shifting to support the growth and research activity very early on. And the work we engage in is multidimensional and extremely collaborative and interdisciplinary. UTA Libraries Division of Scholarly Communication came from a dedication of one third of libraries employees to directly support the open movement while working to amplify traditionally marginalized and oppressive voices. Within the division is the Research Data Services Department, which is where I fall, and it consists of three data librarians and a number of graduate assistants um, from computer science engineering, information systems, urban planning, and other backgrounds who offer specialized skills in data use and reuse. And one thing you may see uh, pop up here and there throughout my presentation is that idea of interdisciplinary, and a lot of what we do is very collaborative. So how are libraries active partners for researchers engaging in open science? As previously mentioned, open science involves an investment of resources, support, and effort at multiple levels, and they exist at each stage of the research data lifecycle. 
Pictured here are the stages of a simplified data lifecycle, including planning, acquiring, structuring, analyzing, and sharing. Libraries have developed services and built-in in, built infrastructure at many, if not all, stages of this process. So this is kind of a quick picture of some of the tools are, that are used in traditional research, um, many of which are proprietary. Obviously, all of the ones in my picture are. Um, these are often commonly used for open publishing with a shift in the end of sharing stages. So uh, we, we'll, we see a lot of shifts there, but I think it's growing throughout the entire research data lifecycle. Many of these tools come at a significant cost that all cannot afford, and they work. So whenever you work with it within those environments or with those tools, like using proprietary file types, statistical software that doesn't track the actions that were taken on your data and other actions uh, like that, they can be inaccessible to others and make reproducibility very difficult or impossible. So as researchers shift to open science methods, new processes and products are necessary for transparency at each stage. So here's a picture of just a few <laughs> open platforms that are out there. Libraries are part of this. They're now building open platforms like repositories and data portals, teaching classes on use of open software. Um, for example, my colleague, the data visualization and GIS librarian at UTA is teaching on OpenRefine next week and QGIS. Um, these are our next two upcoming workshops from our department in our workshop series. And so librarians are partnering with larger resource providers as well to simplify and make easier the process for the researchers in using their resources. For example, in our state, we have the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which has storage options, cloud computing, and statistical services in which our, we assist our researchers in making use of. So in addition to providing products, librarians can be collaborators to further inform your research. With specialized skills, we are able to help researchers across the data lifecycle from, as you saw, reviewing data management plans and also, as you saw, to assisting with data sharing and publishing. We do this by helping researchers one-on-one -on -one during consultations and by holding workshops where we teach different data analysis and visualization tools. Our two previous speakers discussed the ways that librarians assist with planning for data use before research and sharing data after research through uh, the repository. Therefore, for this presentation, I will lightly touch on these while focusing most of my examples on the data collection, structuring, and analysis, and how librarians play a role in these stages as well. During the planning state, in addition to data management planning, librarians can advise on components of a good protocol and assist with pre-registration. We also work with colleagues across campus to develop guidelines and to make resources and services more clear. At UTA, the Data Stewards Club, as we call it, consists of representation from the libraries, as well as the Office of Research, IT, Information Security, Innovation and Commercialization, and others. Together, we work to communicate across offices to make requirements clearer and more consistent to researchers while providing services to support their work and hopefully make it easier. The prime example of informational resources is our work on the UTA data portal, which details what resources and services UTA researchers can utilize at each stage of the research data lifecycle. Um, Hamad is our data management librarian and also assisted in this effort, along with our as associate university librarian for scholarly communication. Now, as we move into acquiring data, depending on the expertise, librarians can provide guidance on best practice practices for designing data collection tools, uh, particularly surveys to have well-structured data at the completion of the collection. I laugh because that's a very common question that we get. Um, as I mentioned, we also provide a significant amount of training on use of software, programs, and other tools for data collection. For secondary data, Librarians have awareness or the ability to find data sources that may be useful for your research. And we assist researchers in the process of submitting requests 
or applications to data sources, including projects with research data centers and other data providers in which there is a lengthy process for accessing the data. For structuring and analyzing, uh, some of those processes are a little bit overlapping, which is why I kind of put them together here. We assist with um, kind of instructing on how to structure a data set, what are tidy data principles, what are um, method, methods for collecting or in, importing, parsing data, and other things that might be necessary for structuring it as is needed for analysis. Um, we also uh, provide workshops on database design, um, utilizing a database, and other data structure for, and formats. In both camps, we obviously assist with numerous tools, everything from SPSS to R to Python to MySQL and, and, and ArcGIS and so on. Uh, and we also assist with storage. We work very closely with um, the Information Security Office and the Office of Research and uh, Information Technology to provide good guidelines around storage options for the particular research that that person is doing, whether they're working collaboratively within the institution, outside of the institution, on their own, they would like a network drive, cloud solution, or something else. Uh, but we obviously focus on uh, data as an asset. We would like to keep data safe. We would like to uh, make sure that there are no issues with losing data or losing access to some of the data or not being able to understand the data that you collected. So we do a lot of work and guidance around that. In the analyzing camp, we, um, we at UTA don't really go as far into research design like um, which statistical tests to run? Do I have enough power in my study? How do I, uh, you know, streamline my code and things like that? We have a st statistician at our university who provides those services. However, depending on where you are, you may have those services either from the library or from an office that works very closely with the library. And so reaching out to your librarian can allow you to know where those resources may be on your campus or at your institution. Um, we also assist with open workflows, like using, utilizing tools like Open Science Framework and other tools that make a lot of the processes that you go through throughout your research process open. Also, don't forget librarians or researchers as well. We offer a lot of expertise around um, certain areas, some of which I have highlighted here. So, um, Obviously, we have a focus on information literacy, which is the ability to find, appraise, and use information. Uh, this is often where collaborators, especially in health fields, will work with us toward completing systematic reviews and other projects around uh, information retrieval, information uh, searching uh, behaviors and information seeking behaviors of certain populations. There are other areas as well. I mean, end of my slide, I mentioned scholarly communication, which is researching the trends and patterns in research communication. So where are we going with open? Um, how many are publishing open in a certain discipline? What are patterns in data citation? What are patterns in data availability? Uh, almost kind of meta science, studying the um, science behavior and or scholarship behavior if you want to open it up outside of science. Um, we have domain specific research aims as well. For, for me personally, I am a public health researcher and there may be other domain specific ways in which librarians uh, apply their knowledge to uh, particular research questions. And then of course there's information organization, which is around you know, how to structure a database and things like that. So don't forget your librarian as a collaborator as well because it may help inform your research to um, add them as a researcher as part of your project. I wanted to provide an example of this, a uh, recent example of this. We created the COVID-19 dashboard in March this year. I don't even know what year I'm in anymore. In March this year, we created the COVID-19 dashboard with the effort of visualizing data from the entire Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Um, believe it or not, there was nowhere else you could find it. Each county was reporting their own numbers. Um, many cities 
uh, overlap counties, so none of the numbers were accurate standing alone. For example, if you wanted to know how many cases were in the city of Dallas uh, and you went to the Dallas County website, you were only getting one third of the counties that are represented for the city of Dallas. And so you were, you were re reducing the number of cases that you were aware of because you were going to one website. Therefore, the aim of the dashboard was to integrate all of those uh, data sources into one dashboard and provide a more holistic, comprehensive view. Uh, we, run, we ran this for about two, a little bit over two months and until there were more data sources out there that were more comprehensive, that had teams behind them to be able to take on that massive effort. Uh, that led into a collaborative research project with public health faculty at my university which was we just presented at the American Public Health Association conference, and we're working on uh, kind of the final edits of a paper on COVID-19 data availability and um, kind of structuring uh, of how the data are made available around COVID-19 by all of the states in the US. So that's just an example of how you can partner with your librarian as well to kind of superpower a lot of the research that you're doing if it's related to their re research areas as well. All right, now getting into the final phase, which is sharing. Um, there, you may probably already are aware of the benefits of open, open scholarship, open data, and open science. For open scholarship, I have some numbers on the screen. I'll read them out just to be accessible. 30% um, uh, more, so, uh, so articles that were published green open access showed 30% more citation than those that were published closed. Also, an additional 9%, um, also articles that published their data as well openly saw a 9% increase in citations. And I imagine that will increase as more and more um, individuals become aware of data availability statements and accessing the data that are underlying many studies. Uh, there was a research done in Nature Communications that showed that the articles that were published open access had double the number of views or an additional 100% uh, as far as the number of views of those articles, so people actually reviewing those articles, and a higher SNP score, which accounts for basically kind of that citation practices, um, but looking at it within a discipline um, framework. We assist with sharing in our data repository as well. We have a data repository in MAVS Dataverse. And, um, but we also, as Michael mentioned, work with researchers to deposit where it makes sense, either where it's required uh, for a funder, where it makes sense for impact and reaching the audience that it needs to reach, or um, various aims that may be associated with sharing that data. For example, um, working with the National Institute of Mental Health Data Archive and making sure the data are able to be interoperable with the data that are there, or working with um, ICPSR to provide a whole new data set. So a lot of what we do is very individual specific, uh, project specific, and specific to the kind of outcomes and needs of that project. There are other areas in which the library provides support. Here are a few examples of that. Um, that includes helping you find what, where to publish, whether it's an open access journal or other options such as that. Um, some libraries also fund article processing charges so that your article is locked open rather than paying subscription costs every year for your article. Uh, the library would just pay upfront for your article processing charge and then that article is forever available, forever in the sense of how we know it to be. Uh, and then assisting with copyright, whether that's keeping your rights, whether that's depositing in an institutional repository because of the terms that were agreed to between you and the publisher and um, basically reusing any items or using it to teach. And then we also assist with um, Assessing your research impact, what is all of this, what are all these actions in this effort? How do they result? How do they help you uh, obtain tenure? How do they help uh, our communities? 
how do they uh, contribute to health and growth in our research and furthering our, our efforts. And so our libraries provide a lot of ser services and they vary, like I mentioned at the beginning. And so I definitely recommend being in contact with your librarian, even if you're unsure that they provide those services, it's still useful to communicate with them because if they don't, they'll often either know who's providing those services or be, be willing to help you anyway. Uh, at UTA, we also provide services around data storytelling. So <clears throat> I have a couple examples here. On the left is age friendliness map in, in Columbus, Ohio. And on the right is the Dallas death map. Um, and all of these are, are detailed and talked about in our library blog using our visit the week. We had a vis visualization every week that we shared kind of what was behind that project on our website and you can see all of them outlined there. It was a full semester of posts. And so that was last semester. So you can visit and see some of the projects we've worked on and get some ideas of how your librarian can be a partner uh, in some of your research. Lastly, I'll mention we also have spaces. You may be familiar with a Digital Scholarship Center where you are. In our case, we have uh, the Data Cave, which is the Center for Data Creation, Analysis, Visualization, and Exploration. Um, it serves as a classroom and lab for exploration. And so um, uh, this is kind of a space for people to come build community, for them to come and learn. This was a picture of a workshop on Python where uh, people were coming to learn how to utilize it. Um, we also have a not pictured there, kind of on the other side, a collaboration space where researchers can come and discuss with us um, options for uh, a new project. And we have GRAs who man the space and provide support around some of our most commonly asked about technology and software. So it can look completely different or completely the same where you are. I highly recommend getting in touch with your librarian and finding out a lot of the services that you provide. But overall, open science leads to uh, more rigorous reach research. It leads to reproducibility. It also shows that we are good stewards of our resources because as I mentioned, this is a very um, time and research resource intensive effort. It also shows that we respect the effort and sacrifices of our human and animal subjects for anyone engaging in that type of research when we are making uh, everything that we can be with respect to privacy and confidentiality available so that others do not have to collect the same data again. And so I appreciate everyone for uh, attending this uh, session and I will conclude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peace, and thank you again to all three of our presenters for these fantastic presentations. I hope that this has uh, inspired you to meet your data librarian if you don't already know them. Um, and uh, thanks again for just sharing these great resources. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for questions, but I would encourage you to hop over to the Slack and ask any questions you have there.